Good morning, and welcome to Mandarin Baptist Church, uh, San Fernando Valley, the English ministry service on this wonderful and beautiful Sunday morning. Today is a special day. Today is Mother's Day. And so for all of you mothers out there, uh, we want to wish you a very, very happy Mother's Day. I hope that your family has treated you well this morning. Perhaps you received uh, breakfast in bed or some promissory note that uh, someone is going to be doing all of the dishes and all of the laundry, wash your car or whatever that might be. I hope that you are blessed on this day in the days to come. We owe a lot to our mothers, um, and we are grateful that God has placed them in our lives, and so we want to say a special thank you to our mothers this morning. Would you join with me now as we pray and ask God's blessing on today's service before we begin our worship and song and praise. Father, we come before you right now and we dedicate this hour to you and ask that you um, bless uh, our gathering Lord bless our people bless the hearing of your word may our voices raised to you this morning bring honor and glory to you um, Lord we are grateful that we are able to sing about the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So, Lord, we give this hour to you and ask that you speak to us. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship the Lord together. The Lord is my life, my salvation. Send me high upon the rock 
I worship you with all my mind. I worship you with all my strength for you. The mighty God, I put my faith in you. Jesus, take my hand, let me follow you. Change my life, oh Lord. Make it be like new. I will follow you, Lord, every day of my life. I will worship you, Lord, every day of my life. Jesus, take my hand, let me follow you, change my life, oh Lord, make it be like new, I will follow you. Every day of my life, I will worship you, Lord. Every day of my life, I will follow you, Lord. Every day of my life. I will worship you, Lord, every day of my life. I will worship you, Lord, every day of my God, thank you that wherever we might be and however we might be separated physically, that we are one in the bond of love and that our common bond is the Lord Jesus Christ and our love for him and his love for us. God, thank you that we get to praise your name and and to lift up our voices to you in song. Uh, thank you, Lord, to, for the freedom that we enjoy in this country to do just that. Lord, I thank you for the offerings that have been collected. I thank you, Lord, for the faithful who uh, give cheerfully. And I thank you, Lord, that we belong to a church that uses those funds uh, in a way that brings honor and glory to you. So Lord, thank you for allowing us to earn an income and thank you, Lord, for allowing us to be a part of the work that you do and the kingdom that is being built in your name. We love you, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, before we get started in our message today, I have uh, very, uh, really no specific announcement, but just to encourage you to go to our website, go to nbc.org, uh, where you will be able to find all the pertinent information uh, regarding what is going on in our church. We do look forward to, and we have begun the 
the meeting process, uh, the talking stages of what it will look like when we reopen. And uh, so be in prayer for that, that God will allow us to open very soon and uh, we'll be able to uh, join together once again in one place. Until then, we will continue to worship the Lord as we do. Uh, we will continue to hold our services virtually, and um, we're thankful that God has allowed us the opportunity to do, to do that. Well, today is Mother's Day, as I have said, and um, I am uh, grateful and um, excited about bringing you today's message. I call it the superhero in the home. In 1975, Ed and Patsy Bruce, they wrote a song which three years later became a number one hit uh, in the country music charts when Waylon Jennings and Willie Nelson uh, covered the song in their duet album. The title is this, Mamas Don't Let Your Babies Grow Up to Be Cowboys. And the chorus goes something like this. <clears throat> Mamas, don't let your babies grow up to be cowboys. Don't let them pick guitars and drive them old trucks. Let them be doctors and lawyers and such. Mamas, don't let your babies grow up to be cowboys. They'll never stay home and they're always alone, even with someone they love. Now, <clears throat> I must admit that that was a song that I liked uh, growing, uh, uh, gr growing up and after high school. And uh, it's a catchy song. And at the core of every mother's heart is, uh, is this deep desire to see their babies become someone they can be proud of. As someone who's respected and honorable, someone who is productive in society, not picking guitars and driving them old trucks. Now, that's just a, a line in a song. There's nothing wrong with picking guitars and driving old trucks. In fact, I do both of those things. But it's just a, a songwriter's sort of warning, I suppose, to all mothers to not let their babies go down this lonely road that he has taken. We may be disciplined by our fathers, but most often we learn to be disciplined through the consistent nurturing love of our mothers. Before Marvel, DC Comics, and Robin Hood, there was Motherhood, the original superhero. So today, we're going to look at probably the most famous mother in history, Mary, the mother of Jesus. We know from Scripture that her pregnancy was not normal, to say the least. She, had Joseph, she and Joseph had to endure ridicule and gossip of the community. We know that she was a devoted person who was devoted to God, and she was submissive to his will. We know in Luke chapter 1, verse 38, it says, And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. But now many years have passed since Mary spoke those words, and Jesus was now almost a teenager. And that's where we pick up in Luke chapter 2, verse 41. We see, first of all, that Mary was a mother who was 
dedicated. Luke chapter 2 verse 41 says, Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. Every year they did this. Now, Jewish males over 21 originally were required to attend all three major annual feasts of the year. But in the first century, because uh, the, so many of the Jews lived outside of Palestine, they were being scattered all uh, everywhere, that they changed the rules and they reduced that requirement to one feast per year. We see here that Mary and Joseph were dedicated to God in the law of Moses where they are attending the feast of the Passover. But what's interesting here is that only men were required to go. So Mary's attendance at this feast, it shows her devotion and her dedication to God. She went beyond the requirement. She went because she was devoted and dedicated to God. Mothers who love God, they dedicate themselves to God. They trust in the Lord. And they're devoted to him. They depend on God for wisdom and for direction. We see, second of all, that mothers are protective. Look in verse 42 and following. And when he was 12 years old, they went up according to custom. And when the feast was ended... As they were uh, returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it. But supposing him to be in the group, they went a day's journey. But when they began to search for him among their relatives and acquaintances, and when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem searching for him. So here now, Jesus is 12 years old. He was close to the age of his bar mitzvah. Bar meaning son and mitzvah meaning the law. So he was close to that age when, when Jewish boys are 13. They become a fully accountable to the law. It's just on the eve of that, just before that, Jesus still just a boy. Verse 43 says the feast had ended. They headed back. But Jesus stayed behind without his parents knowing. Now you might be asking the question at this point. How can a mother and a father leave their 12 year old son uh, behind in a big city? Well, let me just say that before you give Mary and Joseph a failing grade. Remember, don't you don't want to read scripture through your culture, but through the culture in context to when it was written. And in their culture, traveling to and from the feasts were done so in caravans where they traveled together for safety and companionship. Usually the men and women traveled separately. So all the men would travel, uh, walk together, and all the women would walk together, and then the children would walk together and play along the way. But I have to ask you, have you ever had that conversation with your spouse? Go something like this. Where's Johnny? I don't know. I thought he was with you. It's such a sinking feeling, isn't it? When for a brief moment, you don't know where your kids are. It's like all the oxygen has been sucked out of the room. And it doesn't take long for panic to set in. 
I remember uh, a few years ago when Donna and I went back to Florida to visit our daughter and our then our only grandchild. And we went to our favorite spot, the Cracker Barrel, and we were waiting to be seated. And finally, uh, they were showing us to our table and we were walking toward the table. And when we got there, we we realized that our granddaughter was not with us. I've got to tell you, it was panic city. I went down in lockdown mode, and uh, I went and notified the manager, and I ran out to the parking lot, and I scoured the parking lot first, uh, and then I worked my way back in. I went to where the gift shop is, where all the toys are. She was not there. I went back to the table to reconvene and to see if they had any news that was different from mine. And there she was. It seemed like hours. It was only a few minutes, but it seemed like a long, long time. And what she did was that she, uh, at, at this restaurant, there are these little games that call the peg game. And they were, they have them on the tables. And it's just little golf tees and you jump over and, you know, it's just a, it's just a game to pass the time after ordering your food. She got enamored with that and just started playing with that at another table, which was behind a wall and lattice, and you couldn't really see her, but she was quietly just playing this game over there. But it was a sinking feeling for that moment, just thinking, where is she? Verse 44 says, they went a whole day before realizing he was not with them. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine? Now, there's a difference between being protective and being overprotective. Protective is good. Overprotective is not good. And where and how do you strike a balance between protecting them and letting them explore? I suppose Mary could could have insisted that Jesus walk alongside of her or Joseph. Then he would have missed out on being a kid and being able to explore with other kids and develop friendships. So where's that balance? How does a mom strike a balance between protecting them and letting them be kids that all depends on the child's development and his or her disposition but great mothers great mothers usually figure that out through trial and error and by asking God's wisdom Mary and Joseph allowed Jesus freedom to be a kid in the confines of their religious culture. Had they not done so, they would have been spared three or so days of anxiety, to be sure. But they would have also missed the following verses and what I believe is to be a a gem found in Scripture's. Verse 45 says they went back to Jerusalem to find him. And in verse 46, after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Even at 12 years old, Jesus provides a great model for us when we're having conversations with others. You see, the first skill that he's applied there is listening. We don't do this enough in our conversations. I don't do this enough in our conversations. I immediately go to the the, the fix-it mode. Jesus was a good listener. 
Husbands, listen to your wives. It doesn't mean you agree with them, but listen to them. Listen to what they're saying. Listen to their hearts. Moms, listen to your children. Wise moms listen to their kids and they hear what they're saying and they hear what they're not saying. The second skill that Jesus applied here was that he was asking questions. The best learning takes place not when we blindly follow our teacher's instructions. But when we discover the why behind those instructions. Moms, are you approachable? Can your kids ask you questions even if it's the same question over and over and over? Because in that, even... If nothing else, you can teach them consistency with the consistent answer. So look in verse 47. It says, And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. Now this should have been a proud moment for Mary. Her 12-year-old son, he's sitting with a bunch of old teachers who study the scriptures all of their adult life. He's listening and he's asking questions and the teachers are amazed at his understanding. That should make Mary very proud, but not so. Verse 48. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. Now when we read that in the English, it says that they were astonished. But in the Greek, that literally means they were struck with a blow. This didn't sit well with Mary. They were not happy. They were happy that they found him, I'm sure, but not happy about the whole ordeal. Why have you treated us so? Mary asked. Have you ever said Something like that to your kid? Have you asked that question? Do you remember saying anything like that? Something like, I provide everything for you and this is how you thank me? Or, this is one of Donna's favorites, you're going to drive me to drink. Thirdly, Mothers distress over their children. Look at verse 48. The second part. Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. Now she says, your father and I. But I just got this feeling that maybe Joseph is, is probably over there thinking. I knew he'd be fine. He's a smart boy. He's practically a man. He's like his dad. He's fine. That's my boy. But mothers stress. They stay awake at night worrying over their children. While the dad is over there. Snoring away. Even when his Time for their grown-up children to to leave the nest. You know, like at age 30 or somewhere around there. 
Some mothers still want to keep them in the nest. Now we got to cut some uh, slack for our mothers here. Because it's, it's in a mother's DNA to be nurturing and to be, to be caring. And that's going to be the case no matter how old their kids are. But moms, sooner or later, you're going to have to let them go. My encouragement to you is don't wait for that time to prepare yourself. But to prepare now for when that time comes. Sooner or later, they're going to leave your house. And they're going to... To start their own families. But we also see that mothers trust God when they don't understand. Look in verse 49. And he said to them, Why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And they did not understand the saying that he spoke to them. Now there are two major historical significance in these passages. First, these are the first recorded words of Jesus. The very first recorded words that Jesus spoke at 12 years old. And then second, this passage is the last historical record of Joseph. We don't know what happened to Joseph. Some say that he died in a, an early age after having children, uh, other children with Mary. But we don't know what happened to him. But here, when Jesus said, Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? It shows that he knew something of his origin and his purpose. But for mothers, sometimes their, their vision and purpose for their children are in conflict with God's will and purpose for them. They want them to become doctors and and lawyers and such. And dads, we are guilty of this too. We place a high expectation on education and degrees and status. We want them to graduate from the most prestigious schools. They become a source of pride for us. While it's not a bad thing to place uh, high expectations on your children, don't forget that before they are your children, they are created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared in advance for them to walk in them. God has a plan and a purpose for your child. And your job as a parent is to help them discover that purpose. Not to create one for them on your own. Mothers who are dedicated to God and tuned into Him, they understand this. They usher their children into the presence of God. If you struggle, moms or dads, if you struggle with letting God rule in your child's life, you've got to let that go. Don and I, we have three kids. We have a girl and two boys. 
they're all grown up and, and uh, married and have kids of their own. When they were growing up, we expected them to do the best that they could. But to us, following Jesus was more important and reflecting his character in each of their lives was what we wanted them to grab hold of as they entered into adulthood. Today, all three are walking with Jesus. They honor him with their lives. They teach their children to know the Lord. No prestigious degree from a school next to their names can equal the blessings of knowing that your kids follow Jesus and honor the Lord with their lives. Jesus had an had a purpose for his human existence. And every one of your children has a purpose too. Don't forget that. Your job as parents, your job as a mother is to usher your child into the presence and purpose of God. One other thing that mothers are good at, one of their superpowers, is that mothers know that there is a bigger picture. Look with me in verse 51. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. Now here's a, a freebie for all the kids listening. If Jesus can be submissive to his mother and father. Then you can too. You can be submissive to your mom, to your dad. By the way, it's not a bad idea, no matter how old you are, to always be submissive to your parents. It doesn't mean that you have to obey every word. That's not the word submissive means, but it means to honor them by continuing to place yourself at a lower rank. My grandkids, they say, yes, sir, no, sir. Yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. Now, some say that's a southern thing, but it shows respect and honor for their parents. I love that. Now this phrase, Mary, she treasured up all these things in her heart. It's not the first time that Luke has written that phrase. It happened one other time in the previous chapter after Jesus was born and the shepherds came to, to worship him. And as they went away and began to spread the news about the Messiah being born. Mary took in that moment. She treasured that event, that time in her heart. The word treasure, it means safe keeping. She didn't know all that was in store for her baby boy. But one thing was certain for Mary. 
She knew that he was born for a purpose. And now he's 12. Her heart has just experienced three whole days of stress and anxiety. And now Jesus is talking about his father's business. Now surely he wasn't talking about carpentry to these teachers. She didn't understand it all. But she knew there was a bigger picture. And that's one of the greatest superpowers of moms. Is that they see the bigger picture. That's why when they see their they see their children, not for what they are, but for what they can be. That's why mothers never stop praying for their kids. That's why they never stop seeing the best in their kids. That's why they never stop believing in their kids' potential. Many years ago, I was a, my family were missionaries and we lived in, in Japan. We didn't have a lot of disposable income. In fact, we had none. And I remember when my dad came home with uh, pieces of bikes from a scrapyard. And he took those pieces and he put together one decent bike for three of us boys to share. I remember it was painted the same color as the house because there was paint uh, left over. I was very appreciative of it, but at the same time, my Friends had all these fancy bikes, new and lights and turn signals. And I mean, they were fancy compared to this old relic of pieces of a bike. Still, we appreciated it. We had fun with it. We would take turns riding it. And one of the things that we liked to do was to... Uh, there was a, a hill by our house and it, it led up to a Buddhist temple. And we loved to, we, we built a ramp down at the bottom of that. And we would go up at the top, we would take turns and go up to the top and, and we would get up as much speed as we could and, and we'd jump on this ramp. See how much air we could get. I mean, that's what boys do. It just, it was fun. Well, it was my turn. So I took the bike up to the top of the hill and I got us some speed. I thought I was doing really, really good. Then I hit that ramp and I nailed it dead center. It was a perfect jump. I went up in the air. And as soon as I was up in the air, I mean, for a moment I was flying. I mean, that's every little boy's dream, right? Is to fly. And I felt like I was flying. And, but then immediately the bike broke in two pieces. Now, how do you land a bike that's broken in two pieces? The whole front of my body from head to toe was covered in scrapes and cuts and bruises. And that's when mom comes to the rescue right she hears the crying and the screaming and she came to the rescue but that's what moms do when you've fallen when you're hurt when you've been defeated I don't remember what I said to her but it was probably something to the effect that that I should be able to have a nice bike like my friends, that life is not fair. I don't remember what I said. 
But I do remember what she said. In one statement. Just a simple phrase. It immediately and forever changed the way I thought of fairness. I went from feeling defeated to feeling victory. Just changed my perspective. Here's what she said. She said, Danny boy, when you get to heaven, God's going to let you ride a lion. Now, I don't know. Is that, is that true? I don't know. It may be. But what she did in that one simple phrase in that statement was she pointed me away from my earthly circumstances and she pointed me to think heavenly. My focus went from earthly to heavenward. She pointed me to God. She pointed me to God where all things are possible. She taught me to be heaven-minded. Mothers, that's the power God has entrusted you with. To speak into your children's lives, to point them to Jesus. To point them to eternity. To salvation. In Jesus Christ. Thank you moms. For your sacrificial love. Thank you moms. For pointing the way. Thank you moms. For never. Giving up on us. Thank you, moms, for nurturing us back to spiritual health when we fall. Thank you, moms, for loving us unconditionally. Happy Mother's Day. May you be blessed on this day. May your heart be filled with joy of the impact that God has given you on this world. Let me also thank spiritual moms. I know that there are some of you who have not been able to have children of your own, but you are no less significant you are just as important to God and you're just as important to the body of Christ and you're a spiritual mom to so many and in many ways it's even more important because it is a spiritual matter and so happy Mother's Day to you as well. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the gift of mothers. We thank you for the role that they play in shaping our lives. We thank you for the way that you have loved us through our mothers. Thank you, Lord, for their sacrifice. When so many mothers, they 
they do so much for everyone else before they even think about themselves. What an example they have set before us. Lord, we want to honor our mothers today. I know that there are some of us who our mothers are no longer with us. They're with you. Thank you for that wonderful gift, Lord, that we will once again get to see them. I pray a special blessing on our mothers, Lord. Give them courage to endure any obstacle. Lord, I know that in our midst today there are broken-hearted mamas. Mend their hearts, Lord. Encourage them in their faith. Some are hanging on by a rope. And it's about to break. Reach down and grab them, Lord. Secure them. May they know that they know that they know that they are in your care. Energize them. Renew them. Revive them. Restore them. Because we need our mothers. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, beloved, I hope and I pray that you will have a wonderful week and that God will show you the mission that he has for you to carry out this week. And I look forward to joining you once again next week. May God bless you and keep you.